welcome to tonight's class. And uh, I'll turn the um, the mic over now to uh, tonight's uh, facilit facilitator, Josephine Yuri. Hello again, my name is Josephine Yuri, and I'm going to present to you the life and the works of Lucy Parsons. And she was known, well known as an anarchist. That's what she des um, described herself as being. And Lucy was uh, born in 1851 to an African-American slave woman. And her name at birth was Lucia Carter. And um, she presumably had a deceased infant son who was fathered by Oliver Benton, formerly known as Oliver Gaddix. And um, there isn't a lot on Lucy Parsons' youth, what it was for her to grow up as a child in the Deep South. And what is given is, is some speculation that it was extremely difficult. She was a very beautiful woman. Um, her, back, her genetic background was African-American, Native American, and Mexican. She was a, a brown-skinned woman. And she was, as I had said, she was very beautiful. But um, she suffered some atrocities such as rape. And it didn't say, just knowing the history, that history in the South, I could imagine she was raped more than one or two times. And her family, as I had mentioned before, uh, her father and siblings and mother, mother, they all moved to Waco, Texas. And she met Albert, Albert Parsons. And they had similar political views. He was um, a very handsome, very smart man. Um, he, he worked with the different newspapers and um, that's how she be, that's how she got to know him was his political work there in Waco, Texas. However, being in Waco was not conducive to what they needed to do. It was very racist, and for an interracial couple, it could be very dangerous. So what they did, they decided to pick up, just literally pick up their belonging belongings and they moved to Chicago. Um, in, 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 in the scheme of things, they had two children. Um, the first child was Albert Jr. And they had a girl named Lula. And, but upon arriving in Chicago, um, she, and, she and her husband, Albert, were met with some very downtrodden, very, very poor people who were working in the different factories there. They were working ungodly number of hours a week. They were making very, very little money. And the, the I guess you could say the, the controllers or the capitalists of these factories were just basic users. They used them to produce and produce. And these people, they were not enjoying the fruits of their labor. And they were just basically being used as wage slaves. And um, she had hid her, Afri uh, Lucy had hid her African-American heritage so that she could protect herself from the atrocities that were committed black, against black people in the 19th century South. But um, she never recounted the details of what she had seen in the South. And she, and she always vehem, vehemently denounced the, atrist, the atrocities committed against other black people there. And so coming to um, Chicago, uh, she then became an anarchist. And her beginnings dealt with, or went back to 
Lucy opposing partisan politics, such as the Democrats and the Republicans. She stated that both of them pursued dictatorial policies, which limited freedom of all Americans. Anarchism, she thought, was the safeguard of liberty. And um, some of her childhood experience that influenced her, de her decision to become an anarchist. And as I had said earlier, many of her childhood experiences have never been disclosed. And we can't find any substantial research on that period in her, in her life. And at best, it can be speculated that she suffered many of the same atrocities as did most Black people in the 19th century, century South. Most of, most of what is written and researched about Lucy starts with her marriage to Albert Parsons. And their initial association, the political left, was through the Social Democratic Party and the first international founded by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. And it was through this contact that the, the Parsons became aware of the socialist ideology of Marxism. And their ties to these groups were short lived since both the organizations were disbanded in 1876. And that was the same year that the, the Parsons became uh, affiliated with it. And after the breakup of the, two, of the two parties, they joined the Working Men's Party of the United States or the WPUSA. And Albert was a representative in that party. And um, this was a time that ended, um, ended the Reconstruction era and the start of the first general strike ever witnessed in the US, which was the great railroad strike of 1877. The, uh, the WP USA witnessed, I'm sorry, the WP USA did not start the strike, but it was the most active political party to lend its organized political support. And this strike took place in Chicago, Illinois, which was a city of misery, as I had mentioned before. And Lucy and Albert encountered this, encountered this in 1873. And out of this strike and the political womb of the WP USA were born. The first black socialists in the United States Lucy Parsons and Peter Clark, who was associated with the Cincinnati branch. So those were the first two um, socialists or the first two black socialists. And um, then she went on to just do a myriad of, uh, of speeches and writings from poetry, uh, letters and speeches that she gave on, on, on the speaker's block. In other words, you know, in the middle of in the middle of a crowd, in the middle of the street, and the woman was she was a pistol. She was um, very outspoken, and that's putting it mildly. She was not afraid of anything or anybody. And um, a city official from Omaha, Nebraska, mentioned that she was more scary than a thousand rioters. So she did not bite her tongue. However, her husband was a little more quiet. And he, he being a socialist, he saw going into the change, it, to any political change, he wanted to go into it in a peaceful manner. And whereas Lucy was just um, just a little bit more fiery than that. And um, she was um, involved in different protests, such as the Haymarket police riots, which was the biggest and the most violent. Um, they tried to blame a lot of the, the people from the party for a lot of the destruction and mayhem. But in actuality, most of the destruction was done at the hands of the police force of Chicago. And they 
killed some people in that uh, quote riot. Um, following the okay, following the Great Chicago Fire, she helped to start to start the International Working People's Association or the IWPA. So as you listen, you can see that you will notice that she was a a very um, determined organizer and a good organizer. And she was, um, that's when she worked a lot with the unions back there. It was mostly in Chicago. And she was involved in the infamous strike to support an eight hour workday. She was also active participant in the industrial workers of the, of the world or the IWW. And as time went on, she was involved with the the um, the CPUSA. However, Lucy was never quote a communist or a car carrying communist, and she made that known. She said she is an anarchist. She did not align herself with any political party, and um, and she declared being an anarchist up until she died. And she noticed later in her life how people were becoming consumers, mass consumers. Um, they forged social bonds that at times competed with those among workers on the job in the union hall or on the picket line. The city of Chicago, this had grown into a pinched parochial and ungenerous environment. Lucy wanted to still see changes in economic conditions among the working poor. So she was a leader or a spokeswoman for the, the poor who worked in factories, um, on street, uh, street gangs, or, you know, uh, street um, improvement gangs such as the city, you know, the city workers here. And she was, uh, that's who she was an advocate for, was the poor, the, the working poor. And she had been labeled a purveyor of hopelessly outdated ideas favoring anarcho um, syndicalism. And in, in, despite the opinion, opinion, opinions of her, she still held on to the belief that trade unions were the vehicles of revolutionary change the overthrow of the wage system and capitalism. Lucy began to distance herself from participating in Chicago's Communist Party. And that's where it, it indicates that she was not a party member. She was not um, a supporter of either the Democrats or the Republicans. She, as I, as I will say again, uh, termed herself as an anarchist. However, though, she did feel that the, the Communist Party would go on and on and would not pass away like other organizations because she thought that they had um, substantiality. Okay, she, Lucy saw a lot of tragedy in her personal life. Um, she saw her husband, Albert, hung or murdered in the Haymarket Square, on the, in the gallows of the Haymarket Square, in which he was accused of inciting that riot. He was not, he was not the instigator as he was not even around the Haymarket area at the time of the riots. But that was um, a kangaroo court that led him to his execution. And I will always call that a murder. Um, because the man was unjustly uh, put, to, uh, put to death. And so upon the death of her husband, it was just Lucy and her two children. And she marched those children through all of the demonstrations, brought them to her speeches, and just basically drilled it into their into their being the importance of uh, marching or, or the importance of the importance of standing up for the poor the working poor however her daughter lula 
He died at about eight years old from smallpox. And then the son, um, Albert Jr., he was, it was just the two of them. And he lived to be about 19, but he ended up dying in a, um, an asylum, an asylum for the mentally ill. And he had been there for about 14 years. And it shows Lucy was very strong, a very strong woman in, you know, in, um, I guess, getting her word, getting the word out about the plight of the working poor. But with her personal life, she was, she suffered very much tragedy. And her son, who was, as I said, was spent about 14 years in an asylum. That was some of the, um, the results on him mentally. And while he was in the asylum, he was uh, abused by the guards and some of the, uh, the other patients. And it was because of his mother. These people used the excuse of his mother in, in all of the uh, radical work that she had been involved in. And, um, you know, and people wanted to say that she was a communist, that she was part of the CPUSA. Um, Alexander Trachtenberg, who was the cultural commissioner of the CPUSA and head of the international publishers, um, said that Lucy joined the uh, Communist Party. However, it was doubtful since Lucy, despite her age and her failing eyesight, still had her mental faculties, she well understood that the kind of anarchist communism she had championed bore no resemblance to Stalin's communism. In the CPUSA articles about her, there's also no mention that she was a member. And that is something I, it sounds like I'm drilling that into your head, but people, automatically said that she's part of the CPUSA, but she was not. Um, she was a socialist Democrat or uh, basically socialist. She didn't, she didn't even attach the word Democrat. She was a socialist. That's what she, um, that's how she identified herself. Okay. And that's a, that's a background on Lucy. And if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to ask, and I'll try to answer those. Okay. Okay, thank you, Josephine. Uh, we'll now uh, open, uh, I guess we're at the point where we'll open the floor for comments or questions uh, from participants. So if you have a comment or you have a question, please use your raised hand icon to indicate, please click the picture of the rate of the hand to indicate that you want to speak and we can open your mic. Please use, uh, click the raised hand icon to indicate that you want to speak and we will open your mic. Michael, your mic is open. Hi, Josephine. Thank you very much for the webinar. It was very informative. And I, as a historian, you know, consider this to be a key factor, right, in the uh, building of, you know, the workers movement, especially from the perspective of a woman, right, as you explained. Um, but why, in your opinion, do you think that we, or maybe former members of our party and kind of our predecessors, have kind of attached themselves to the idea that she has been a member or not? Obviously, you know, you're saying not, and it's it's a commonly known that she's not, but many say she was. And there are documents that said perhaps, you know, she worked with us. Of course, she would have worked with us in the in the wider working class movement and such. But why is there such a thrust? and kind of this uh, attachment of her being linked to the party. Why, why are there people who just really want her to be part of the party? Thank you. Okay, and thank you for your question. Just from the readings, 
her being such a powerful orator and just such a powerful woman and her ideas, um, her political ideas, they kind of matched communism, but she never, as it is stated, she never said that she was a communist. She, she was not a card carrying communist. I think it's just the communist that CPUSA just wanting to so badly claim this woman as one of them or as one of their own. Her being as outspoken as she was and really out there on the spot, in the spotlight, I think that was probably the reason. Does, does, does that answer your question? Uh -oh. Hello, Michael? Uh, his mic is, is closed now. Okay. Uh, let me see. Um, Alan, your mic is open. Uh, hi, Josephine. Thank you for uh, uh, this webinar. Very, very interesting. Uh, maybe I missed this, but could you tell me what year Lucy died? Okay, hold on. Let me check my notes. She died. She was um, 90 years old when she died. And he died in nineteen thirty-nine, nineteen forty. So she lived through or she she got to I guess sample a couple of centuries, close to a couple of centuries. So yeah, so she was 90 years, she was 90 when she died. In 1925, she was working with the Communist Party. And in 1939, um, she was thinking about joining the Communist Party, but she did not. So it was shortly thereafter that she died. And so what it shows is that she was active almost up until the day she died. She was a very active woman. Anna, your mic is open. Anna. Hi, thank you so much for the webinar, Josephine. I had a question about um, Albert Parsons. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about his death and his hanging and the reasons for that and the circumstances surrounding that event. Okay. He was hung, as I said, in the gallows there on the Haymarket Square. I think even though he had nothing to do with those riots, he was not the instigator, but they needed a pawn, in other words, and they needed to try to move in on this couple to quiet them forever if they could. And they brought him in on trumped up charges. He wasn't anywhere around the Haymarket Square you know, during the riots, but they caught up with him, threw him in jail, and also Lucy was in jail, but, in, at, but at a different jail. She wasn't able to go to the hanging. She wanted, you know, to see him for the last time. And so they, that was basically what was behind it and, and his outspokenness, even though he was a quiet gentleman type person, he was a, a a printer, and he also wrote in the first newspaper that he had um, that he had started. Okay, and I don't have. I'm sorry, but I don't have the name of his newspaper right in front of me. But he is, even though he was a quiet type of person, he was still considered dangerous. In the Chicago Fathers, or whatever you were, you might want to call them, they felt very threatened by this couple. Okay, okay. is that Norma, okay? Norma, your mic is open. Norma, your mic is open. Hi. Uh, thanks. I had to miss the presentation. I have to get it on recording. My son is in town and stop by briefly on his way out <laughs> back to New Orleans. So, but I did have, um, sorry, did you say something? No. Okay. No, uh, 
I, I saw the write-up of the uh, presentation uh, that we were also going to talk about anarchism, and I have some nice ideas about anarchism, if I could uh, bring us into that. The, uh, I'm sure we all think that Marx uh, promoted anarchism in the sense that he said uh, that the state would wither and, and implied uh, you know, with the withering away of the state, that mm -hmm. anarchism would be the structure, and it would come about as a result of us having gained, gained the world, you know, <laughs> having yeah. gained the controls that we need, the structures that we need, where we could have our discussions about what we need to do in the form of, um, oh yeah, do we we need this uh, 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 garden here? Well, I don't know if we need that garden there. And then we talk about it and then we work it out and uh, we get a consensus of what to do. And everything is worked out in a ways of a positive event that serves the community where there doesn't have to be the infighting that goes along with keeping with with making sure that our owners get profit. Mm -hmm. which seems to be the contradicting factor in all the arguments that we are forced to make, which is why our governments are always unsatisfactory to us, because they're always, Democrat or not, concerned with being sure that the owners get their profit, otherwise we can't get anything done. So with that outlook about anarchism, that it's fallen into being a uh, disreputable approach. It's unfortunate because it's really our aim. Our aim is to live very simply, and we can't do that under <laughs> these complicated government structures, governmental structures. So right. if if people could have this uh, further idea, you know, we go from one stage to the next, and there are a whole lot of organizations uh, the country, the cheese collective, for example, some places, many places that it goes on, that there are collectives in existence that are an example of a uh, steps in the process of uh, you know, overthrowing the capitalist government, which a whole, of course a whole other project because they're going to kill us if we try, but <laughs> we're just going to yeah. have to learn how to kill them back. Um, but anyway, that, that the objective, I think, is desirable and, and attractive to people. And if we can learn to present it in a, you know, if we teach ourselves to present it in a way which does appear appeal to the mass and that they contribute and say, yes, I really want everything for all of us, mm -hmm. uh, that we can advance our struggle. I mean, we need unity. The strength comes from the unity. The front lines will be killed because they keep killing us. But eventually, you know, I mean, look at the Russian Revolution. Okay, that basically, um, Lucy, although she was very fiery, as time went on, she started to temper a little. And in one of her speeches, she declares herself as an anarchist. And she said, you expect me to have a gun in one hand and a, a, and a torch in another. And she said, that's not what um, anarchism is about. And she was, um, had, had uh, become more tempered, however, she knew what, um, what she wanted the, our society to be eventually become like. And as you were mentioning, you know, to do it in a way that is appealing, but it's not a good idea maybe to be so threatening. And if you don't have the firepower, that's the last thing you need to do is try to attack something and you don't have the firepower, firepower to work with. And um, she, she, she took that same, as you were just stating, she had that same attitude towards the end of her life, you know, towards, uh, toward the end of her life. Emil, your mic is open. Hello, and thank you, Josephine Uri, and also the Education Department once more for this wonderful presentation. Uh, it's, it, it hits close to home. When I, one of the times I lived in Chicago, I lived not on the street, not in the building, but in the apartment 
that Albert Spies, another of the Haymarket mar mar marchers, lived in, and only a few blocks from the home in which Lucy Parsons uh, died in that tragic fire, mm -hmm. uh, 3940, I think it was 1940. But uh, lore in Chicago, in Chicago, there's a whole lot of lore about uh, Lucy Parsons. And one of the things is what happened to her papers? after the fire, uh, trusting the Chicago police so much as we do, mm -hmm. um, we were re quite ready to believe that the police had simply grabbed all of her papers and they were never seen again. Have you heard anything about that? Okay, some of the, um, the references that I read, um, I speculate, and I think it gives a lot of uh, openings for speculation, I speculate that that fire was arson, that it was set purposely. And yes, they were trying to um, burn her papers because they had made the police made a comment that you can't even kill a dead Lucy. So in other words, they couldn't get all of her papers. They were able to, people went in there and they were able to, to get a, a lot of her letters. And as you know, I don't know if you know that when papers are packed, they don't burn as easily. And so a lot of things were still preserved. And um, I am finding that I'm seeing more uh, work written on Lucy Parsons. When I first started this project, I only had that one little book, but I've seen uh, several books since that. And um, they, you know, as you were saying, the police were hoping hoping, I'm say, I should say, that they could have burned all of her papers, all of her works, so that nothing could be passed down to the generations. That was the purpose of that. And it was a shame that she burned up in that fire. However, I think the purpose was to get all of her, her works and her writings and her speeches and destroy them. And Bob, luckily, they, they didn't. Bob Rossi, your mic is open. Bob Rossi. Yeah. I think that was a great presentation. Thank you very much. I knew many people who had known Lucy uh, when I was a kid um, uh -huh. and heard many stories about her. Uh, I believe the house fire was in 42 because I know in 41, she gave a speech to international harvester workers there in Chicago. And I think you hit it exactly right, something that no one has said before, that she was active right up to the very end of her life. Yes. Um, I believe the papers, you mentioned the papers that she was working on. I believe that she and Albert were working on uh, a newspaper called Freedom and then The Liberator in Chicago. Mm -hmm. The other thing that never gets said is her work with the International Labor Defense Organization in the late 20s. Um, no one ever talks about that, and I was wondering if you could address that, please. Okay, I I personally have not um, researched that either. The, the international. Okay, say that again, sir. The I L uh, Bob, not sir, please. The international Bobby labor. <laughs> the, the international labor defense organization, uh, which worked very closely with the Communist Party. Um, mm -hmm. I know that she was very active in particularly in 1927, defending uh, many of the case, many of the folks that the ILD was defending at the time, and her role in that was really crucial, because as you say, she spanned generations, uh, and mm -hmm. her opinion counted for a lot. Her, pr her presence counted for a lot. So tell us more about, tell us more about what you know, Mr. Rossi. Well, so in 27, um, 28, the ILD was, really involved in a lot of defense work for coal miners and coal strikers around the country and very involved in racial justice issues. Right. I, I think that Lucy had an outstanding record in defending both groups of people. Um, right. and her, it was something more beyond her name. Uh, I think you, you hit it. You know, she had this, she had lived from generation to generation, but it, it was something more than her name and her energy. Um, right. Her ability to see several sides of things and, and live with contradiction, I think, mm -hmm. was pretty clear in 27 and 28 with the ILD, which was going through a very hard time. 
um, uh, as the party split. Um, so I, this is not my talk. I don't want to take over. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. But, but I, I think you had some real fundamentals. Okay. Yes. Um, I don't didn't have the time, you know, a lot of to go into a lot of her, you know, more into you know, say individually the um, the different. Oh, what I'm trying to say is like you know the, the the different demonstrations or you know her her viewpoint on a lot of on a, a lot of the things that she was involved in. Uh, she was involved in a myriad of uh, of activities, and like you said, you know she was um, she was very genuine about how she felt, and she was. Um, very outspoken. She and she felt I that feel she felt for these people. And that's how she had such a she could have such a close alliance with a lot of these um these organizations and you know along with their demonstrations. She did a lot of demonstrating uh, on the streets of Chicago. But I'm sorry, I just I don't have um information on what you had, you know, what you were explaining to us. Nan, your mic is open. You have to open your mic on your end. Your mic, you just click your mic, Nan. Just, there you are. Thank you. Yes, hello. Thank you for doing this presentation. I just had one comment. Lucy Parsons died on March 7th, 1942. Okay. And again, I just want to say thank you very much. Also, did you have you ever done any research or read the new book that came out about Lucy? I have the book. It's called Goddess of Anarchy. That's yes. the latest book I bought. That yes, I that's what I, I got. A lot of that's what I was. I was curious about that, but thank you again. I, that's the only comment I had was that she died on March seventh, nineteen forty-two. Okay. And thank you again. Really You're enjoyed welcome. it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, Steve, your mic is open. Steve, your mic is open. Uh, hi, thank you very much for the talk. I've learned a lot. Uh, my grandmother knew the Parsons um, way back when. And um, I also knew uh, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. And she was active uh around the same time you know in terms of joining the communist party in the 20s and i was wondering if they ever had anything to do with each other let's say that lady's name again lucy elizabeth Gurley flynn um i think they did she had a you know she had relations with um i guess like professional Relations with the, you know, with a number of people, but I remember that name. Yes. However, I can't, I can't give you any details. I don't have the details. Okay. Any other comments or questions? The floor is open for any other comments or questions. Okay, John, your mic is open. John, your mic is open. You have to unmute on your end. You have to unmute on your end. Okay, you're not unmuting on your end. Let me see, there are some written questions. Uh, Rebecca Schiller writes that according to the IWW website, uh, Lucy Parsons joined the CPUSA in 1939. Um, uh, who? Okay, who is the uh, source for that? Uh, the IWW website. Okay, I. I'm uh, 
it's it's okay. It's just offered as information by one of the participants. <laughs> so and then okay. Robert Philippoff writes, since many socialists tend to favor government action and many anarchists do not, how do you reconcile Lucy being both a socialist and an anarchist? Also, what is the significance of the discussion to the present day? That's written by Robert Philippoff. Uh, let's see. So those are just comments that were offered. Okay. And John has not opened his mic as of yet. So it looks like there are no other comments or questions. Last call for any other comments or questions. And uh, if you want to, Josephine, just wrap up, uh, then we can. Um, Okay. Okay. That the presentation that I have given on Lucy Parsons, um, you 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 got a very small taste um, of what she was involved in. And this woman, when I first started studying her, I said, "Oh, I'm going to be like her when I grow up." I just I just really like her enthusiasm and her, you know, her convictions. She's that the convictions that she has that this be that this be a better world for us to live in. And I want to thank you, all of the people who viewed this webinar webinar. I want to thank you for uh listening to me and I want to thank you for your support. So again, have a nice evening. Goodbye. Okay, thank you everyone. Remember, there will be some summer activities coming up and uh, we'll let you know, uh, uh, we'll make the announcements, but remember, it's really important that you invite uh, uh, other participants to join in. It's one of the ways we can grow our com community. On behalf of Josephine, who is a, a Yuri, who's a friend of our community, uh, I'd like to uh, express our deep appreciation for her willingness to participate with us uh, tonight. And uh, we look forward to working together on future activities uh, 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 upcoming. All right. Thank you again, everyone, and have a good night. Thank you. Good night.